And uh, what I want to talk today about is, as Pradeep was mentioning, just a, a, a finding that is relatively new, but actually not, on, on how we can better assess and diagnose glaucoma uh, and manage it more uh, accurately, called corneal hysteresis, um, this is the financial disclosure. I am a speaker and a consultant for Riker Technologies, which makes this, but it's not going to influence what I, what I say. First, I want to define what it is, because that's actually the first barrier, is what, what the heck is this corneal hysteresis? How is it defined? What's it's measured? We'll review some data and then uh, introduce the, uh, the machine that measures it and show, show some examples. So, you know, the OAT study really kind of, kind of put the cornea on the map uh, as far as glaucoma management and, and how features of the eye can influence how we understand glaucoma. Um, and corneal hysteresis is really, think of it as the viscoelastic nature of, of the eye. And the way I describe it to my patients is I say it's the shock absorbing ability of the eye. And we know that eyes that are very good shock absorbers, eyes that are, have high corneal hysteresis, are less likely to get glaucoma and less likely to get worse from glaucoma. Whereas eyes that are bad shock absorbers are more likely to get worse. So it's kind of thinking of the eye as an entirely, as a spectrum and a viscoelastic spectrum, you know, of what's going on in the front and how it behaves. Because why do we care about really what the pressure in the front of the eye is? What we really care about is how it's affecting the nerve and how it's changing the nerve. So corneal history says it's the only in vivo measure of the mechanics of the entire eye. And I really just think of it as a shock absorber. And, um, and this is how it's measured. And we can go into this. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to take too much time on this. But the way it's measured, this is the puff of air. And you're shining a light on the eye. And there's a, a peak signal as it's being indented and a peak signal as it's being released. And the differential between those peak signals is actually how this number is measured. If you're a physicist or engineer, you understand that. If you're a, a lowly glaucoma doctor like me that just understands pressure high, pressure low, the way I think about this is shock absorbing ability of the eye. Eyes that are a great shock absorber uh, are less likely to get glaucoma. And I, I love this video. This is just a, a video of, of what the eye looks like when it's undergoing this history, it's just a little, little puff, but you can see the indentation and, um, and, and, and the signal is, a, shot, a light is being shown on it. Um, so it's not really novel, you know, there, it's actually been, um, been, there's been studies evaluating corneal hysteresis for the last 14 years, and literally we have evidence of over 80,000 patients in 700 peer-reviewed uh, publications. This first uh, paper kind of demonstrated two things. One we kind of knew and one we didn't know. It was really the first paper that put corneal hysteresis kind of on the map and associated corneal hysteresis, corneal hysteresis independently uh, with the uh, risk of progression. Uh, more powerful than age, uh, corneal thickness, and, and eye abuse. That's what we didn't know. What it showed us that we all know is that we all know that a clueless medical student can get his name on a paper without really understanding anything. So that was, I was a med student at Hopkins at the time uh, working on that project. It's not just a surrogate for other parameters. In normal eyes, there's a weak correlation between corneal hysteresis and pressure and corneal thickness. But when you look in glaucoma eyes, it, there's, there's not really a direct correlation. Population averages throughout the world are around 10. And what we know, as I've said before, is a low corneal hysteresis is associated independently and strongly with prediction and prog uh, progression from glaucoma, whereas a high corneal hysteresis is shown to be protective. So let, one of the first, one of the best prospective studies is out of uh, Felipe Medeiros' group in, in San Diego. Now he's not there anymore, but when he was there. Um, and it's the Diggs cohort. It's a prospective longitudinal-based study kind of trying to evaluate um, progression and the structure-function relationship. And what they did was they took patients and they, um, they, picked, um, they examined them every six months and just were trying to tease out details of structure, function, and progression. And uh, what they did was they took a small subset of patients that had glaucoma, and they wanted to evaluate whether corneal hysteresis was predictive of progression. And they, uh, every six months, they, they, did, uh, they did the corneal history, pressure, uh, pachymetry, and visual fields. What they found, if you look, so the, so the patients that had a corneal history of less than 10, these are the patients that rapidly got worse. Not all of them did. Not all of our patients get worse, thankfully. But what's, what you saw, what you see is that patients that actually had a history of greater than 10, very few of them got worse, and very few of them got rapidly worse. So uh, it has really a, a significant understanding, and it's, um, it's, it's two times more predictive of visual field progression than pressure. 
and it's three times more predictive than corneal thickness. So I, I, think of corneal I think of corneal thickness as a poor man's hysteresis. I mean, I think corneal, hysteresis, uh, corneal thickness put the cornea on the map. We're understanding this better, and I think corneal hysteresis is a better way to understand the mechanics of the eye. This is, I think, a, another powerful slide that came out of it. You know, a patient that has, a, and this is something we know, but we couldn't explain, and, and corneal thickness doesn't always explain it. But, you know, a patient that has a pressure of 25 and a corneal hysteresis of 11 is, a, is less concerning than, uh, than a patient with a pressure of 18 and has a corneal hysteresis of 6. That patient is more likely to progress in this study. And, and that, I think, is what's hitting the head on the nail, uh, is hitting the nail on the head, is really kind of, it, we think that corneal thickness was the initial thing, but I think we've all seen exceptions to that rule. I think this is a much more powerful way to predict that. Um, and it's not just a correlate, you know, for, um, for, for corneal thickness. It, you know, Goldman apination, we know that corneal thickness was, was, is influence, influences corneal, uh, Goldman apination, but not necessarily corneal uh, hysteresis. So in this multivariate analysis, it was three times more predictive in prog um, predicting progression. And this is really the first prospective study that demonstrated that. You know, this output of this machine is, it, it shows a couple things. It, when, you, when you have a patient that has a prior LASIK or any types of things, the history just kind of falls out, but there's also another output called ILPCC, which is a patented algorithm that the company has that gives you what they think the true pressure is. And that can still be used in patients with prior refractive surgery, um, and I use that in my patients um, to get a better understanding of what I think the true pressure is. This is very powerful in, I think, normal tension glaucoma or low tension glaucoma. And this is a retrospective study that basically took patients, that, 82 patients with low tension glaucoma, and they split them. They said, what was the average? The average in this group was about 10. And they said, okay, anybody above that average and anybody below that average. And what they found was the patient that had a lower than average hysteresis, two thirds of those patients progressed in this study. Whereas the patient that had a, uh, a higher than average hysteresis, only one third progressed. So again, it's teasing it out and it was more powerful than any of the other baseline characteristics that we're seeing. So there's very, very good evidence that reflects that corneal hysteresis is a, a pressure independent way of predicting and, uh, a patient's risk of progressing from glaucoma. This was a, 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 probably Dr. Romelu's fellows that did this, but um, basically they took a bunch of patients, normal patients, um, 30, 62 normal patients and 38 uh, patients with glaucoma, and they put a, a LASIK suction ring on them and they elevated their pressure by, uh, for 30 seconds up to 64. That's how you get into Hopkins uh, for fellowship. Um, and uh, and they, 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 they measured the deformation of, of the optic nerve head. And they found that patients that had a lower hysteresis had a greater deformation of the optic nerve head than patients with a higher hysteresis. So it's really giving you that insight into how the wall of the eye changes when it's exposed to pressure. So this is what the machine looks like. Um, and this is the output that it has. There's three numbers. There's the IOPCC. It's what the company thinks the pressure truly is. It's the corneal hysteresis. It's the IOP Goldman. This is what they think Goldman should be. And then it's the wave strength. And let's show a couple of examples. So this is uh, from Felipe Medeiros, uh, a patient that he thought had relatively controlled pressure, a thick cornea, almost 600 microns, um, but over four years progressed, progressed with nerve, thick, nerve thickness uh, fiber loss, as well as progressed with an increased vis uh, loss in visual field. This patient had a corneal history of 8.6, lower than average. So this patient you know, may be controlled at 15, or you presumably controlled at 15, but progressed because they had a lower than average hysteresis. This is the opposite. I mean, this patient, it's a 71-year-old lady that's been followed for four years. She has thin corneas, 442 microns, and a pressure of 15. With that kind of visual field defect, in my clinic, those patients have a pressure of 11. I don't tolerate 15. I, I, I'm very aggressive with these kind of patients. But this patient didn't progress. He watched her with a pressure of 15 forever because she had a corneal hysteresis of, of 10. And over four years, we know that that patient actually did not progress and because of her, because of her um, higher than average corneal hysteresis. So this is the first patient. When I got the machine, this is the first patient I, I, I tried this on. It was a 34-year-old woman of Indian descent, a no family history glaucoma, slightly thin corneas, pressures were 10 on Goldman, and uh, normal MRI, the brain enormous had the full neuro uh, ophthalmology workup. She has a classic, classic wedge defect down below. Um, and um, and you, it's correspondent on, uh, on OCT, and, um, and this is her right visual field. This is her left, this is actually from, from Chennai, uh, when she brought it from her, when she was living in Chennai in 2006. And this is 2015 with me, a new uh, 
small uh, central scotoma. So uh, I look at her pre-treatment. So look over here. Pre-treatment, her Coleman apinations were 10 and 11. This is the left eye had the field defect. Her ILPCC, based on the hysteresis machine, was telling me it was 15 and 16.7, with a very low corneal hysteresis in her left eye. So, you know, based on some evidence from like the Logit study, I said, well, let me put her on bromonidine twice a day. And this is what blew me away. She comes back, and her Goldman apinations hadn't changed at all. 11 and 10. This is a non-responder in every other situation. Any drug study we've ever done, any patient we ever looked at, their Goldman apination did not change despite starting a medication. This patient did not respond to bromonidine, what we'd say, without this machine. But look what her ILPCC did. Her ILPCC went from 16.7 down to 11. So it's showing that in these patients, we're measuring something that's not right. And, and, and we're missing something. Goldman apination is, is the gold standard. It's great, but it's, we're missing something. And this has really blew me away, and it showed me why this patient was getting worse. I'm not measuring her appropriately. And now this is someone who I do hysteresis on every single time because she's a little different than the average patient that I have. Here's another example. A um, patient came to send, see me with a, uh, sent in by an optometrist for evaluation of a disc hemorrhage. Slightly myopic, average corneal thicknesses, Goldman apination of 13 and 14, you know. And, um, you know, has, uh, but I, I did hysteresis on when I saw him. Again, low corneal hysteresis, 8.7, 8.9. IOPC was 16 and, uh, and 17, despite having an applination of 13 and 14. So a classic... Uh, Classic uh, glaucomatous nerves. Uh, the disc, I didn't get a picture of the disc hemorrhage. I, it had already slightly resolved, but I think it was like right, it was right here. Um, and again, you see, confirmed by OCT, still corresponding loss on, on, of nerve fiber line on OCT. And you can see a slight, slight nasal step in his, um, on, his, uh, on his visual field. Uh, again, same story. I initiated latanoprost back in, in June. His pressure was a 13 and 14. He came back 13 and 12. Again, a, non, a somewhat non-responder. We wouldn't be too excited about that. But, uh, but what did his IOPCC do? Not only did his IOPCC go down at what we'd expect to see, but his corneal hysteresis slightly improved, or about the same. Um, but, but again, this is, showing, uh, this is showing that this technology is, is allowing us to risk stratify our patients, pick them up appropriately. So there's that question about, okay, how do you treat a patient that's a myope with parapapillary atrophy, a visual field defect? You know, we, I, you know, we look at all these things. I look at their pressure, and now I look at their hysteresis. And if their hysteresis is low, I'm more apt to treat them. If their hysteresis is high, I'm less likely to treat them. And, and these, are, these are very powerful for your ocular hypertensives. You know that um, that you know have a pressure of, of 18 and maybe a suspicious suspicious nerve. If they come in with a corneal hysteresis of 13, higher than average, I follow them once a year. If they have a corneal hysteresis of eight, I actually will be inclined to uh, to treat them. So we're getting more information. They actually um, on the 15-year OATS data, they're actually going to be reporting on corneal hysteresis. So uh, that's going to be very exciting to see if that can help us further understand this 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 measurement. And, um, and I think this is just an insight, a slight insight into the behavior and the biomechanics of the eye. And, and, and hopefully in, in, in 10 years we'll have an even better one. And I'll be here saying that hysteresis is a poor man's corneal schmukubuku or something, you know. So, um, but right now the way I think of corneal thickness is it's a poor man's uh, hysteresis. And, uh, and a corneal hysteresis depend, represents how good a shock absorber the eye is and how well the eye can absorb and dissipate energy. There's without question very good evidence that corneal hysteresis is an independent risk factor for progression, independent of IOP, independent of corneal thickness. And, um, and I think it really can give us a better idea and a better way to determine who we treat, who we don't treat. So thank you guys for your time.